episode of the video is made in the Hi, welcome everybody. We're going to go ahead and hold for just a few minutes while the room populates and then we'll get started. Carol, you said that if they raise their hand and we um, hover over them, they'll they'll come to the, when they raise their hand, they go to the top of the list? That's correct. Okay. And it looks like we've slowed down. So I think the room is populated. Christine and Jan, if you wanna go ahead. Thank you, Carol. Well, welcome everyone to the May meeting of the Equal Access Book Club. When the Guide to Assisting Students with Disabilities, Equal Access in Health Science and Professional Education was published in 2015, it really filled a gap for those of us involved with the education of students with disabilities in the health sciences. But since then, much more has been written about students with disabilities and accommodations. So we're so excited to bring you this book club that reviews the second edition. Today, we'll be covering chapter five, accommodations in didactic lab and clinical settings. And we wanna thank all the authors of this chapter, including Jan Sarantino herself, who's with us today, Lisa Meeks, Neera Jane, Grace Clifford, Alicia Booth, and Jane Deerfield Brown. So we are your moderators today and we'd like to tell you a little bit about ourselves. So Christine, why don't you begin? Hi everybody, I'm Christine Lowe. I'm a board member for the Coalition for Disability Access in Health Science Education. And I'm the Director of Disability Services at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City. It's really a pleasure to be here with all of you this afternoon. And I'm Jan Sarantino, and I am the past president, past vice president-elect, past secretary, and past board member of the coalition. But now I am past president and no longer on the board. Um, I retired in 2017 from the University of California, Irvine, where I was the Director of Disability Services. And I've taken a part-time job at University of Colorado Anschutz School of Medicine and have had a wonderful time putting into practice some of the new things that we've been learning. This second edition of the book, Equal Access for Students with Disabilities would not exist without the fantastic editors, Lisa Meeks, Neera Jane, and Elisa Laird. And there are so many others who have contributed to the book, and we're grateful to all the authors who are listed on this slide for their time and talents. And our National Book Club it is co-sponsored by a number of people. And these individuals, it would not even be possible. So I want to personally thank um, AHEAD, the Association on Higher Education and Disability, for their assistance in the Zoom platform, which is completely invaluable. The coalition, designated interpreters who are um, on today um, captioning our book club, and of course Springer Publications, our publisher. We are so grateful for their support of this novel way to explore the second edition of Equal Access for Students with Disabilities. So some quick guidelines for today's book club discussion. As moderators, our roles are to post some questions based on the fifth chapter of the book, uh, accommodations, and to facilitate a discussion among all of you. Please be civil and respectful and encourage participation and support for each other as we navigate the multiple perspectives of our audience so we can learn from each other and grow as a community. The best way to engage in discussion on Zoom is by using the raise hand function. If you do that, we can then call on you and unmute you to speak. If you don't wanna raise your hand, another option is supposed to comment in the chat function. Questions to moderators can be placed in the Q&A feature. We would love to hear from as many of you who are comfortable joining in and sharing your thoughts, experiences, and wisdom. And to encourage participation, everyone who actively participates in this meeting by posing a question or comment will be entered into a drawing for a free book. We'll keep track of participants and we'll have a random drawing at the conclusion of this meeting. 
So don't forget to participate. Let's get started. So before we get our first question, let's get a little bit of background. So the amount of extra time a student may need to take exams should be directly related to the impact of the disability related limitations on a student's functioning. So here's the question. How does your office determine the amount of extra time for the following types of assessments? Didactic exams, standardized patient exams, anatomy exams, and quizzes. And we'll open it up to those who um, select uh, in the Q&A or post a comment. Christine, we have a lot of shy people today. We do. I know you guys are not all this quiet. Somebody oh, just needs to jump start hand. us off. Okay, we have a raised hand. Hi there, this is Laura, Laura Bulk, um, one of the coalition board members. Are you able to hear me? We can hear you, Laura. Okay, great. I'm calling in, so I wasn't sure. <laughs> um, so I think oftentimes it ends up being, um, we have kind of a standard 1.5 times for written exam. And then if someone seems to need more, um, then it's a conversation, um, which is problematic. And then we have uh, four practical exams, uh, such as an OSCE, um, we uh, look at different components for different tasks and do kind of an activity analysis of the exam and then determine extra time for specific components of those kinds of exams. Thanks, that's all, unless I missed part of the question. <laughs> I thought I'd get us started. Thanks, Laura, that was great. What are other people's thoughts? How do you guys handle it on your campuses? Hi, this is Cindy uh, Poor Parasol with Rutgers. Uh, what we do with the didact, what well, with all of them is take a look at what the impact of the disability is. Um, is there more than one disability impacting? What has been, what has worked for the student in the past? So looking at um, the, the student's input. Um, with um, exams that aren't didactic, we may work with the, the faculty or the, the clerkship directors to get their feedback into what is essential and what is not. Um, and I, I have to admit just about five minutes ago or 10 minutes ago, I finished reading the chapter. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll also input that um, from reading. Uh, if, a, if a student doesn't know what they need, we may take them into the sim lab to practice and, and, and figure out how much of an accommodation they need. What about anatomy exams? Those are quite different, especially when um, there's a, um, the entire class needs to rotate through and um, identify um, uh, body parts. What I, what I learned from Lisa on that when I first started my position was it, it you may have the, the students that need extra time go in a group and either they could be the very first group or the very last group um, so that they are, are all going at the same time. And again, from reading the book, um, the instructor could take pictures um, and, and the students could um, use their, not rotate with the groups, but instead use the, the photographs um, along with their extra time. Thank you, Cindy. Are there any others who have um, um, different information to share? 
I think I've been unmuted. This is Terry Edwards. You are Terry. Thank you. And for anatomy exams, I um, haven't been at two different med schools. I've seen it done two different ways. For one of them, the students were given um, time and a half for each station and their lab practical was scheduled when the other students were taking the written component of the exam and then vice versa. Uh, another way that it's been done is that when the lab practical is done, students leave, the students with extra time can leave, get water and come back if they want to sort of um, maintain confidentiality. And then they're given an extra 20 minutes of free roaming time in the anatomy lab. So they can go back to um, areas where they needed to have a little extra time. Thank you, Terry. Is there someone who would like to comment on standardized patient exams or OSCEs, the different portions of the OSCEs? I can chime in on that while somebody else comes up with their answer is, uh, have done two different accommodations. One is for a student with a reading um, learning disability and we just added in extra time for reading the door note. And then for another student who um, was a stutter is we gave additional time during the standardized patient encounter so that they didn't have to rush introducing themselves and the individual, the standardized patient getting used to their verbal pattern. Great, great. Okay, Christine, do we have anyone else that would like to contribute to um, this discussion? I don't, I'm having trouble seeing the raised hands, but I don't see any raised hands. Okay, so then shall we go on to number two? Yeah, let's do number two. Periodic review of the effectiveness of accommodations is important to student success. How does your office review and adjust approved accommodations as needed to ensure that the accommodation adequately addresses the barrier for each student? Does your office provide explicit directions to students about how to initiate a revision of their existing accommodations. Do you see raised hands? Not yet. I'm waiting for our, our attendees to um, get their name in uh, with a question or comment so that they can have their name inserted in the random drawing for a copy of the book. Okay. Maybe I, we, oh, do we have a raised hand? I think so. Chapter 12. Um, no, I'm not seeing a raised hand at this point. Dina? Maybe if we maybe if we split the questions, can you go back to question two, Jan? There we go. Oh, well, can you go back to question two? I'm not sure what's happening because I'm not moving anything. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so sorry, everyone. Uh, how does your office review and adjust approved accommodations as needed? to ensure that the accommodation adequately addresses the barrier for each student. And now you do have a raised hand, Dina. Hello. Um, one of the things we do is, um, especially with things like OSCEs or other clinical settings, is we discuss with the um, either clerkship director or um, instructor for specific clinical settings or assessments like OSCEs and discuss what is exactly appropriate for each setting. Because what might be appropriate in uh, a clinic, you know, a medical clinic setting may not be appropriate in a hospital a ward setting or even for an OSCE. So we do look at each specific clinical site, clinical setting to determine if the approved clinical accommodations are appropriate. 
Great. That was something that Cindy also brought up was bringing in content experts to review um, accommodation plans. Yeah, so there's a lot of interaction, a lot of um, that interactive process that happens not only with the student, but also with the department and instructors. Great. Anybody else have thoughts about how you do this on your campus? Yes, I've just unmuted our phone in caller. Lisa. Lisa, can you, there you go. Oh, I see you. You there, Lisa? She's muted still, so there we go. Sorry about that. Um, I, so Laura, I, uh, am, I have a sore arm, so I'm holding my arm up this whole time. I can't actually lower my hand from the phone. I can only raise it. So I'll invite you to lower my hand for me if you don't mind. All right, what about Lisa, were you asking to speak? Let's see. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, well, I was gonna say uh, students on our campus, DRC students on our campus, often approach me about um, wanting to review their accommodations and maybe um, either because of a new diagnosis or maybe uh, a change in their current disability that they would want to come and speak to me about the new barriers or kind of heightened barriers that they're experiencing. And so we may review and um, I may determine different accommodations for them. Great. Lisa, kind of, yeah, can I ask you a little bit more? You are going on. Sure. Meaning. So, uh, so um, when you initially meet with students, um, do you uh, discuss with them the various parts of their program at that initial meeting? or do students come to you as the different portions of the program change from didactic to lab to clinical simulations, that type of thing? So both really. So in the initial, I would call it the initial or the intake meeting, if you will, I'll talk to them about their program, um, where they're, it generally is characterized by didactic learning, versus um, when they're in their clinical aspects. And different programs have, um, some programs have clinical components each summer of their program. Some are um, just in the third year, some are just in the fourth year. So prior to clinical, I do have a very separate and directed conversation about planning for clinical accommodations. Thank Those can be a semester before, 18 months before, um, depending on when the program starts their kind of site selection, if you will, or determination. Labs, um, those typically are come up in conjunction with their didactic learning and so that's usually a secondary component to the initial meeting. With some programs, um, it's very explicit that let's say for time and a half, that that only pertains to written quizzes and exams. Um, so there would be different consideration if it would be for a, a competency, a skill. And that would initiate or require um, an additional conversation, similar to what Cindy had um, highlighted earlier in her conversation. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah. That was that was great. 
Does anybody else have other thoughts or things they want to add? How they I manage this on their campus? Uh, Rhonda has raised her hand. Hi, Rhonda. Hi, everyone. Um, I was just wondering, uh, could we get the names of the persons who gave the first few uh, comments for follow-up? Uh, I think they gave really relevant examples. Um, and in terms of periodically assessing the effectiveness of the accommodations, we are a professional school uh, within the university and we rely on the accommodations office at main campus to make the accommodation determination and then we implement it at our professional school. Uh, but sometimes we get feedback from the students here that it's not working or it's not helpful. So I think I will follow up now that you've asked this question to see what is their process for, um, you know, kind of determining the effectiveness once an accommodation has been granted to make sure that it really is meeting the students' needs. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. And I would also potentially follow up in terms of Jan's line of questioning in terms like how do they update accommodation plans as students move through their programs? Because again, they move through all of these different, um, different types of training and they might require different things at different times. And I've just up allowed Alicia to talk. Alicia, if you wanna unmute. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Hi, Jan. Hi, Christine. Hi. I just wanted to share in the review process, one thing that I find very helpful, um, when students come to us and they know that something isn't working, I mean, that's a best case scenario. But what I, because you can examine that, but what I have noticed a lot is that students sometimes need prompts or examples in reviewing their accommodations. So sometimes they know something isn't working or something may not even line up quite right, but they don't exactly know how or why. So I think in the meeting process, giving some examples and scenarios, asking very you know, specific scenarios, how, you know, what was the uh, result when you did this with this accommodation and going through a more detailed process helps them to review it a little bit more critically and perhaps to come up with some solutions together in the process. If a student is able to identify the issue, um, then of course it, it might be a little bit easier to solve. But I think sometimes there's just this not knowing how to review their own accommodations um, throughout the process. The other issue that we run into a lot is just finding a time to reach these students with their busy schedule. And that seems to be really the biggest issue. They may have identified a problem, but figuring out where to put that in between you know, on-call shifts and clinical hours and tests and all those things, all those barriers. So really being creative, it could just be text, you know, texting or WhatsApping or short little check-ins. I find that to be a little bit more effective than let's call a meeting and have a one hour uh, conversation, which seems to really put medical students in a tailspin, if you will. They you know, it's there's how can I have one hour extra uh, this week to do that? Um, and, and a question that I have for other people, something I've always wondered about is how much feedback do you ask from clerkship directors or preceptors that you work with perhaps after a rotation is finished? Has anyone ever had experience asking um, the site how effective some of those accommodations were. I know that could be a little bit more tricky in terms of asking those direct conversations, but I'm always curious what the preceptor's experience is in the process as well. Those are good thoughts. And um, usually I, I know at least it, um, in my experience, I don't really have much contact with, with um, preceptors it's the clinical directors who, and the site directors who communicate back to us how something is going or not going. Um, 
So, but yeah, I, I think Dina um, raised her hand again. I, I'm not sure if that was in error or um, if she wanted to add something to this conversation. And I don't see Dina. So should we move along, Christine? Hello, um, sorry, I, I was I was not able to unmute. I wasn't. <laughs> There she is. I was not invited to unmute. Well, I don't have an answer to Alicia's question because we have not had conversations with preceptors um, like that, but we, we have gone back and spoken directly with instructors, usually when we're talking about another student or another class, uh, another clinical setting for a student, we'll ask how it went in the previous one. But um, so those conversations sort of happen naturally, but I, they're not specifically planned. But what my, my comment was is that one of the other things that we let students and all of the um, programs know, and I know everyone here knows this, but oftentimes uh, the programs don't realize it, is that the clinical accommodations cannot change the clinical requirements in any way. For example, I just recently had this conversation um, if a student has 50% additional absences and it's deemed to be appropriate in the clinical setting, that doesn't mean that they get to reduce the required clinical hours. So if they happen to, um, and it is also above and beyond the already allowable because um, every program has a policy in place if a student gets sick or something. So it's beyond that policy. Um, that the student has to somehow make up any hours if they don't meet the minimum clinical hours for a specific part of the program. Yeah, good, good point. Um, I just wanted to echo what Jan had said um, in terms of getting feedback from a higher level, you know, the clerkship directors or the, the faculty course directors. Um, and I know at our campus, we usually end up doing that um, in kind of larger group meetings um, and also informally um, directly with the DS office. I, I also wanted to, for those of you who gave the first few answers, um, Rhonda had asked if she could get contact information or, or names of those people. So if you wanna put that into the chat, that would be helpful. And then Patricia Kelper had added, um, we do send a survey out to all DS students each term to remind them that we're here to make adjustments if necessary. So that's another way Excellent. that you can reach out to your students to let them know that you know changes can be made as they as they move forward or as they try things to see if they're working or not working. So Jan, why don't we go ahead and move to question three? Okay, then it means it's my turn. So uh, there are times when students with certain disabilities, ex for example, visual disabilities chemical sensitivities, dexterity, or mobility issues require a personal assistant or an intermediary as an accommodation. Intermediaries fulfill a specific role, but DRPs must be very careful to ensure that all core competencies are met by the student. Mm -hmm. So our discussion question then is, what are the parameters of an intermediary's role? How would you, how would your program determine whether or not an intermediary would be an appropriate accommodation given the competencies and technical standards of the program? And with Caitlin Martin has raised her hand, there she is. And if she will unmute, there she goes. Hi, um, my experience isn't so much with an intermediary in a clinical environment, but we recently had an experience where we granted a laboratory assistant for a student. Um, it was a student with a temporary condition. The student broke both of his arms. So we yeah. had to hire a, another student to be his lab assistant. So we ended up hiring someone who worked as a tutor in the tutoring department. So if they were familiar with the terminology and we made an agreement that basically said, you know, the responsibilities for each. So it delineated that this lab assistant would be scribing for him word for word 
that they wouldn't be changing anything or providing prompting or commentary or anything without his mm -hmm. initiating um, and that they would be essentially just be his hands, um, no educational or academic assistance and just being the physical, you know, putting stuff in beakers, writing things down and such. And it worked out pretty well. Um, it was our first experience doing this. So it was, you know, a trial and error, but it worked out fine. That's, that's a great example, Caitlin. Thank you. How about others? Uh, Patricia. Oh, did I unmute? Yep. You did. Okay. Well, similarly for um, a blind student, um, we've, you know, we've had to use aids uh, to essentially just be their eyes, to read the graphs, to, you know, the students had to interpret the information that somebody had to be able to tell them some of the more visual aspects of, of the classes. Another good example. Yeah. Um, Megan? Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Hi, I'm Megan Matthews. I'm uh, the Senior Access Coordinator at University of Washington for Health Science students. So I work in DRS at our office. Um, and I'm new to the role, so I actually don't have a suggestion, but I'm curious how this works for like the clinical setting of a student needs an intermediary, like when you're dealing with patients or procedures, how on earth do I find someone that has those skills and can be in, like, I've never seen that work. And I would love to know if anyone has insight or can refer me somewhere to look more into that. Cause I actually have a student who um, might need that, who's entering into the clerkships this year. And I'm just curious how you find that level of skill who, can be safe with patients to do the tasks for the other person. Sorry, that was long-winded, but that's my question. <laughs> it's a wonderful <laughs> question. And um, I'm hoping some of our um, other DRPs out there are gonna jump in because um, Christina and I, Christine and I have explicit instructions not to commentate, but <laughs> to allow the discussion to um, unfold organically. So I'm hoping some of you out there will uh, help Megan here with your, with your uh, insight in what you've experienced. We have Brian. Brian, can you uh, unmute? Are you unmuted? Okay, am I unmuted now? Yes. Okay, very good. So I don't have an answer to, to uh, Megan's question, but I wanted to, to drive a bit of a distinction. For students that we have, we're working with in laboratories, so people that might be pre-health sciences, we've actually used the terminology uh, in-class academic aid um, because that, that drives a distinction that this person is working solely in an academic setting and solely to aid an individual uh, so it's not confused with a PA. Though I do think it's a real, uh, a real challenge if you're trying to figure out what is the role and scope of an intermediary. And I'd love to hear some answers about that myself. But one of the things when, when we're looking for somebody who has the appropriate skill, it would be a student who has previously taken the course, somebody who is in a GA, TA, or assistant level role, or could you bring in you know, a health science professional, either from somewhere in your university or from an outside agency and give them some training about what you expect them to do in the role. And really what you're trying to do is to make sure that they have enough knowledge so that they can follow the prompts and not be an additional barrier. But beyond that, I don't have much, uh, much help to give. And I saw some, uh, uh, someone okay. else, Jacqueline? Uh, Jacqueline, okay. Hi, um, this is Jacqueline. I'm from Washington State University. And from my point of view, um, I think an intermediary would be more like a job coach where 
they're not trained to do the job, but they're there to prompt the person or they're there to um, do some sort of assisting. So I think the less they know about the field, probably the better because they're only there to follow directions and not, well, I guess it depends on what it is. I mean, if they have to be the site and say that the blisters look like circles versus ovals, um, that might be something different, but um, I think it really depends on what their needs are. Because if it's like where they have to take directions to like the original example of like move beakers and stuff, it's, uh, you know, you want them not to know what what's out there kind of a thing so they will follow the directions and not try to correct or try to put their educated opinion into what they should be doing but I think I think it just depends on what the needs are of the person thank you what what about when somebody has to work with a patient what tasks I think it depends on what tasks they need to do though like what what tasks does it need to that they need the intermediary for like is it because they're blind and they can't see the blisters and they cannot distinguish if it's an oval versus a circle or like lifting positioning it could be any of those things well, doing you would... physical uh, uh, a um a, a a medical student doing a history of physical or a specific part of an exam you know, like an ear exam or, uh, you know, examining the throat. I think it depends on what the limitation is on what the throat is. Like what, like they're examining a throat. Like what are you, what, what can't they look for? So let's and, look back at the, at the background to the question, people with visual disabilities, dexterity or mobility issues, someone who can't hold an instrument or someone who can't, maybe someone who's of small stature, how are they going to use an intermediary to, um, to complete their tasks? Is this Alicia? Yes, I'm back again. Hi, Alicia. Um, I don't have as much experience working with blindness, uh, although I have witnessed it and I have seen different approaches. I would have to agree with Brian that I feel that if an intermediary is actually performing hands-on activities with the patient or has to do physical components, that there would need to be some previous training or that the university provides some training. I've seen where with, uh, for a blind student getting a guide, but the guide have a medical assistant background, something that will aid them in the process. And like with most intermediaries, training them on what to do and what not to do. So they, even though they could perform all those tasks with the patient, they know that there's limitations um, in terms of the, or I shouldn't say limitations, there's certain expectations of what they can do for the student so that the student can fulfill that learning process. So, you know, it's, a, it's very much a conversation between the intermediary and the student on every single role in, in my experience, it doesn't go perfectly in the first patient encounter. You usually have to leave that patient encounter and say, you know, I, this is what, how I felt that experience went and how did you feel that experience went? I feel maybe I crossed the boundary there or maybe I didn't do enough. And it, it is a conversation in the process. Um, as a sign language interpreter and working with sign language interpreters as an intermediary, we have governing bodies that help us give, provide us guidelines to know where we should step in and where we should step out. So in a way, everyone is safeguarded because we know our limitations in you know, where we should be providing extra um, language support versus, you know, providing too much language support. 
So perhaps a, a conversation and maybe even some written guidelines about what is appropriate. And th that might be developed throughout the process, not all in the beginning. So I'm gonna refer everyone back to the chapter five uh, and starting on page 130, where the, um, the section on intermediaries um, begins. And so I think that for a lot of you that have questions about it or haven't experienced intermediaries before, that um, those couple of pages will um, hopefully help quite a bit. Um, the training does need to happen by the disability uh, professional and um, in training the, the intermediary to know what they what they are allowed to do and what it's especially what they're not allowed to do it can't be up to the student on the in the clinical setting to start explaining things so they because they're they're doing their own role um, in um, in directing the student so or the, directing the intermediary so I, I really would like to refer you back to that section because there's a lot of good information there um, in that chapter um, yeah in chapter five anyone else would like to um, to contribute to this uh, question before we move on okay Christine I'm going to turn it over to you for question four all right, so what are some types of accommodations used by students in clinical sites? Has your program implemented any of them in the past? What about placement into a particular clinical site as an accommodation? Has your program done this for any students with disabilities? And lastly, what are some barriers to implementing these accommodations in your program? How might these be addressed? So a few questions in there, take your pick. I see Cindy has raised her hand. Hi, Cindy. Hi, I've had uh, students who've had to be able to sit down um, or, or walk around and stretch after so much time uh, in, the, in a, um, a procedure. Um, And, and we've also had students that needed to be close to uh, their sites or close to their, um, where they were receiving um, medical infusions, right? A, a student was getting infusions, so she had to be near that area. Her provider. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that worked out uh, well because the, the university um, works closely with a, with a couple of, of university owned um, hospitals um, or affiliated hospitals. Uh, so we were able to place her for most of her um, clerkship in those two hospitals. And she was okay with that. She didn't feel like she was missing out on experiences um, and barriers. Um, There, there could be barriers if there weren't hospitals uh, that, that we worked with that were near her, her placement, um, or if, if there was a, an issue with getting a variety of experiences that, that students get um, by going to different settings. Um, but we didn't run into that. Cindy, hey, I'm Thank curious, um, how far in advance at Rutgers do the, um, the site directors or the clini clinical directors schedule the rotations or the, the um, clinical rotations? How far in advance? Um, I, I'm really not sure. I don't know. So I was wondering if that could be a barrier um, when a student comes in and the, the uh, rotation schedule is already set for all of the students in the program? The students, at least at one of the medical schools that I work with, 
um, have the ability right away to say that they they need a priority or they need something um, so they are notated right away um, that they're going to be connecting with my office. And I think we had another raised hand. There she is, Dina. Hi, this is Dina again. Um, one of the barriers I find is uh, we have a number of new health science programs. So I have not worked with students going through clinical accommodations in this particular setting. And the student, well, any program, the student doesn't know what to expect because they've never been through this clinical setting either. So sometimes just having those initial conversations can be challenging because they don't know what to expect. So sometimes they're just very nervous about it and it really is gonna be fine. Um, so again, that requires a lot of dialogue, which they all do, but especially with new programs, requires a lot of dialogue with the program in order to make sure that any potential barriers are um, foresaw, foreseen and, um, and help to be removed. But um, in terms of uh, clinical sites, sometimes the student or the program don't get the schedule they know where they're going, but they don't get the times that they're going to be there until a few days before. So that doesn't leave a lot of time to work in any accommodations if a student has some um, time needs. Um, so that, that can be a barrier as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think all of these things are potentially impacted by COVID as well, you know, uh, in terms of um, altering timelines and schedules and availability of clinical placement sites and all kinds of things. What are other people's? Your program has been using uh, telemedicine in for some of their some of the clinical hour requirements. There's Charlotte. Hi, it's Charlotte from the University of Michigan trained Hi, exclusively by Lisa Meeks. And so I remember she said how important it is to actually, and then we, I work with the medical school only, but to go on rounds and to spend time in the hospital because we know that students don't know what they don't know. So the more we can know about what it looks like and what they're doing day to day, it can be really helpful in determining those clinical accommodations. Yeah, Thanks. really good point. Thank you. Dina? Um, Megan? Oh, sorry. Dina, did you want to say something? I saw Megan raise her hand. I'm seeing Lisa's hand up. And Lisa, you should be able to speak. I'm also hey. seeing Charlotte's hand up. And Charlotte, I believe you also should be able to speak. Hi, this is Lisa from the University of Florida. I wanted to offer some other examples. Um, very recently worked with a student that one of her clinical accommodations was the use of, of an assistant, assistive listening device um, that could also include the use of a FM system. Um, and live captioning services that were needed to be coordinated through um, for certain presentations um, and uh, used also a caption telephone system for their needs um, as a more nuanced accommodation for a clinical site. Great examples. Hi, this is Megan. I don't know if you can hear me. Yep, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, this is Megan from New York Medical College. Uh, one of the things we do, um, especially for like our DPT program, we know in advance of where they're going to be. Um, one of the accommodations is doing a, like a pre-orientation a couple of weeks prior so that the student can go in, um, meet you know their site coordinator, 
and have conversations ahead of time so we know in advance of what their needs will be, uh, get a lay of the land, you know, obviously depending on their, um, you know, their accommodations and their disability or their diagnosis. Great idea. Anybody else have thoughts they want to add before we move on? One thing that Dina also added um, in the Q&A was that COVID has made it impossible to see the clinical settings. Um, and also some programs have clinical sites all over the country, not just in the location of the DRP. Thank you, Dina. <clears throat> Okay, I think we'll go ahead and move on to the next question. Um, and that is, uh, students with disabilities may experience exacerbations of their disability that impacts their ability to be present or on time, or arrive on time, determining whether missing class, clinical or lab experience is reasonable depends on a number of individual circumstances specific to each setting and to each student. Discuss the guidance OCR has provided to institutions to help determine whether attendance is an essential element of a course and when might it be inappropriate to approve an accommodation for attendance flexibility. <clears throat> I think we've stumped them, Jan. Hmm. Well, thankfully, we've got some brave folks, Brian and then Caitlin. Well, hopefully brave and not foolish. Um, when you're looking at attendance, it's what role does it play? You know, the students involvement, right? So are they doing things in the physical space at that physical time that can't be learned in an alternate method? So the example that we put on our main campus, we've been having lots of discussions about the appropriateness of attendance and on ground attendance and remote attendance. And the, one of the things is right, if it is a traditional didactic learning environment where the information is just being heard and then being tested on, then there probably can be some attendance flexibility because there are other ways to get that information and still uh, still learn and still perform on the assessment. But if what you are learning is hands-on, if it is uh, a group task that has to be done at certain time with certain individuals, or if the information is scaffolded so that that things really build upon each other. And it's not like you could go and miss and make up certain aspects at certain uh, different times. So those are some of the prongs that we look at. Thanks, Brian. Those are very good um, talking points to have with your faculty. Megan? I'm not Megan, I'm Caitlin, but I oh, got- I'm Caitlin, sorry. Oh, you're fine. You all my M's mixed up. <laughs> um, I agree with everything Brian said. When we provide this accommodation, we do it on a case by case and course by course basis. Um, if my understanding of the OCR guidance is correct, um, we've moved away from having students negotiate that process because of the power imbalance. So my office always negotiates anything course by course, and we'll push back if a faculty member says, you know, we don't allow for absences and we'll really look at, well, is it really necessary to be physically present? And 
usually if it's like a lecture class, it's a lot more flexible than, you know, a lab or a clinical environment. Um, we really can't provide a whole lot of flexibility in terms of clinical environments just because of the accreditation requirements and just the amount of time that they need to be in the clinical environment. I think that's, that's a great separation and, a, you know, again, good talking points to, for everybody to be thoughtful about and to have with their faculty and just to be, you know, a little bit um, prepared when you go in to speak to the faculty and have this discussion. I'm wondering how some of you have experienced absence uh, flexibility requests in light of COVID and students attending remotely and many classes being recorded for students. Brian had a good comment. He, he said, you should also look at flex if flexibility is being provided for others, such as pregnancy or injury. Excellent. Okay, Christine, we are really running out of time. So I think we have to maybe take one more comment on this question and then we're probably gonna need to wrap up. Okay. Brian, did you wanna add something else? Sure, I just wanted to say that AHEAD is actually having a training about returning to campus and remote learning uh, that I'll be part of. And my campus has been looking at that. And, and one of the things that we're trying to get our faculty to, uh, to, to um, examine is, is more remoteness appropriate now that we've done it in the past, that we've built some of the resources. And so what parts of the learning experience could be more flexible for learners in the future? And then what parts of those really need to come back to the on-ground setting because of the nature of the courses, programs, and content? And I, I feel like we've got some, some good prongs and questions that we ask, and I'll try and post those in the Q&A, and then they can be shared. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. That's great news. Also so, a really good transition point, right? Because I think that that's been something we've all been grappling with a little bit as, um, as COVID has um, been hopefully on the downslope about what kinds of, of things are possible that were initiated because of COVID can we all hold on to? You know, maybe we've uh, made some progress in terms of accessibility. And what can we hold on to as we move forward? Okay, I'm gonna uh, move back over to our conclusion here. Um, again, this is has been the May meeting. And um, for those of you who are interested in participating in the July or June meeting, um, you'll use the um, address here. Um, and you can get more information on the, um, the discussion questions and who's facilitating those um, sessions. And then for those of you who haven't uh, received a copy of the book yet, um, you can purchase it at uh, springer.pub, springerpub.com. And if you use this um, book club 25, you can get 25% off the cost to the book plus free shipping. And for those of you who are uh, purchasing bulk copies for your campus and faculty to share, um, please contact Lee Monteville um, at that email address and she can facilitate a, a really great um, price for um, bulk copies. Um, and then We'll wrap it up in our last minute. If anyone has any additional questions or if Christine has any additional comments from New York, uh, on, I'm in California and, and, I, and just by hearing the rest of you talk, we know you're all over the country. We just wanna thank you so much for the work that you do and for how you are making it possible for students with disabilities to realize their dreams of their um, these professions in the health sciences. Christine? Yeah, I just, again, I wanna echo Jan's thoughts about thank you so much for the work that you do. I think, you know, uh, we've made some progress in terms of uh, embracing diversity, including disability, but we still have some work to do in the health sciences and your work makes that possible. So 
Um, Jan, what about our drawing? Um, I think that um, I, I think that that happens at at the conclusion that that person will be notified. I I hope Carol, do you remember? Do we announce a name? I don't know, Jan. I'm so sorry. I, we I can grab the list of people who attended. I'm pretty sure. You did. Um, we can. Okay, we'll get that, and I and I think we'll uh, have Lisa Meeks, Dr. Lisa Meeks, randomly select a name and get that book out to you. She'll be contacting you via email um, because we have your names in the registration, and um, and uh, find out who um, is the recipient of this wonderful, wonderful book. Yes, very, Charlotte, very thick. Charlotte, the previous reads that uh, it's going to be drawn at the conclusion of the book club series. OK, OK. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And um, we'll see you next time. See you next month.